Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 1, And to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles that are not and hast found them liars. And hast borne and hast patience for, the, for my name's sake, hast labored that you've labored has not fainted. Nevertheless, well, wouldn't it have been good if he'd have stopped right there? These people could have said, man, we're good. But nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Pretty strong, isn't it? Would you agree? It's a pretty strong statement. I, uh, I, boy, this is not probably the best sermon or message to end it, but it's what I feel in the Holy Ghost. I want to talk to you tonight about this message that John's given. Matter of fact, I want to call this the message of the last apostle. And, and by that, I'm talking about foundational apostle. Message of the last apostle. Lord, I love you. I thank you for your word that is forever settled. Thank you for your presence, your goodness, your mercy. I now ask God that you would speak to us. Let it go beyond our minds. Let it get into our spirit. Let it find the rightful resting place. Let it find fallow ground. Let us receive it so that it can take and come to fruition. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Confirm your word tonight with signs following. And everybody said amen. amen. All right, turn around somebody next to you and shake their hand and say, I love you. Can you uh, can you stand a little history lesson here tonight? Amen. I uh, John's on the Isle of Patmos, and he's uh, he's there in the will of God. Not the most pleasant place to be. Matter of fact, I've tried to figure out how John probably looked. Historians tell us that he had been put in a boiling pot of oil. It didn't kill him. We don't know if he was disfigured by it. But after that little experience, he was banished or sent to the Isle of Patmos. And you want to serve God. What tickles me as these people went through what they did and we fuss about giving up a few trinkets for God. But uh, he's on the Isle of Patmos and he receives tremendous insight. Best way to explain the book of Revelation is not just so much as a book of apocalypse, but it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's as though that God is putting the finishing touches to the portrait of Jesus Christ so everybody can see it. 
Amen. And uh, now, I don't plan on getting too hungry tonight. I had a handful of cashews before I come to church tonight, so I'm okay. Amen. But uh, John's on the Isle of Patmos, and God's beginning to speak to him and show him some things, and he comes to this moment that he addresses what we call the seven churches of Asia Minor. Each one of these churches received... Uh, things about it that were positive that God wanted to commend them about. And then he would lead into the things that they needed to be corrected on. Because after all, if he is your true father, he chastises those that he loves. If you don't receive his chastisement or his correction, Bible calls you an illegitimate child. And so we watch as his correction comes into place. One of the things that I've noticed about God and the devil, when the devil's talking to you, he always tells you your problem and never gives you a solution. He just leaves you hanging. He condemns you and leaves you hanging there. But when God deals with you, he not only points out the problem, but he gives you the solution and tells you how to fix it, which to me is a tremendous thing. So all these seven churches, they had positive things about them, then they had negative things. But out of all seven of these churches, there's only one church that had its candlestick threatened to be removed. Now, if you read down through here, you've got some churches that had Jezebel teaching in them. Call her old Jesse. Everybody say old Jesse. Old Jesse was teaching in the church. Some of them had all sorts of problems. But it was only Ephesus that was threatened for its candlestick to be removed. And he tells them the reason why their candlestick is threatened to be removed is because you have left your first love. Hmm. Everybody say Ephesus. He's talking to the church of Ephesus. Now, he, he tells them, you need, to, you need to go back from whence thou hast fallen. You need to repent. You need to go back and fix this and take care of this. Now, I find it ironic. Now, I'm going to give you a little history here tonight. I find it ironic that John's writing this and he addresses unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Most people feel like when he talked about the angel of the church that he was addressing the pastor of the church, the bishop of the church. It was he that is the messenger. It wasn't some angelic being. It was actually the pastor of that church that he was addressing. It was the pastor that was going to have to give the message. The angel of God wasn't going to come stand in the pulpit and preach to the church. He was talking to the pastors of the church. Here's the problem. Here's where you've done good, and here's where you need to do better. And I want you to fix this. I want you to take care of it. And so he addresses the angel of the church of Ephesus or the pastor or in those days probably would be better to call them the bishop of the church. And so he addresses this one. He tells him what he needs to do to fix it and he leaves it there. Now, historians get a little cloudy through some of this stuff and all because a lot of them, they, they give different dates when John wrote uh, the book of Revelation. Now, here's where I need you to stay with me and connect with me on some history and some, some theology stuff here. John, and the reason why I'm saying this is, is because I had a boy come preach for me one time. He had just graduated from Bible school, and he preached the whole sermon thinking that John the Baptist and John the Beloved was the same guy. 
And I'm sitting there thinking, Sunday school kids know better than that. So I want to make sure that we understand who I'm talking about tonight. And so John the Beloved writes the Gospel of John. He writes his epistles, and he writes the book of Revelation. Now, when you understand history, you recognize that John is going to outlive all the other original apostles. They're all dying off the scene, dead and gone. Peter's gone. James is gone. All these apostles are gone. Paul's even gone at this point. And so John is the last living apostle that was there, and the Scripture calls him a father. He was there walking with Jesus. He was an eyewitness to his divine majesty. Other people could talk about the things they had heard about in history. But John was first person. I was there when he was transfigured. I was there when he did the miracles. I was there at Calvary. And so it's John. He is the last voice of the original apostles writing to the church. Now, when he's on the Isle of Patmos and he's writing somewhere uh, early 90s or mid-90s, somewhere through there, and the fact is, and this is where I want you to kind of see some things that connect, when he writes to the church at Ephesus and he addresses the bishop or the angel of the church at Ephesus, historians let us know that Timothy was perhaps still alive. He didn't die until he was 88 years of age. They drug him through the streets of Ephesus, and then they stoned him to death. And so there's great possibility, and I feel like it actually happened because of what I'm about to tell you. There's great possibility that it was Timothy that John was writing this letter to about the church of Ephesus. Stay with me now. Amen. And so... <clears throat> It's also amazing that after John, when the emperor died, people were, they were set free and all this. And so I can't remember the name of the emperor, but when he died, John was released from the Isle of Patmos. And he is released and he goes, historians tell us, that he moved to Ephesus. It was Ephesus that he wrote and said, you better fix this because if you don't get it fixed, you're going to have your candlestick removed. Now, the candlestick is the seven churches of Asia Minor. He, G, John seen Jesus walking through the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which was these seven churches that he's going to address. Is this boring? Now, I, I don't want to lose you here, so just, just hang on here a second. Now, he, he's threatened them, and I find it ironic that John goes to Ephesus and it's at Ephesus that he writes, are you with me? It's at Ephesus that he writes his gospel and his epistles. He is in the very place that it was threatened to be removed because they had left their first love. And it's there at Ephesus that John writes his gospel and his epistles. Now, to understand all of that, you, you have to realize that uh, John didn't address a whole lot of things. There was only just a few things that John wanted to address. Remember, he is the last voice. He's the last apostle. And he's going to deal with some things. Now, Paul had already dealt with a lot of things, how to put the church in order. He had dealt with creative order. He dealt with gender. He dealt with all of these things. He dealt with the rift from the Jews that persecuted him and followed him around trying to stop. He dealt with all of those things. But when John decides to deal with the problems at hand, and he's an old man now, and he's looking around, and he sees the situation, and there's just two or three things that he really strongly wants to deal with. The first one is he wanted to deal with what's called uh, the Gnostics. That's the best way for me to put it. And some of the doctrines of the Gnostics. The Gnostics taught that there is actually nothing tangible. There's nothing real. Everything was logos. Logos. Logos just simply means the thought or expression of thought. And so they said that everything that you see is nothing more but logos. It's just a thought. In other words, let me put it to you like this. We're not sitting in this building actually tonight. Some God somewhere is thinking all this. 
So if you get your finger caught in the door, that's not real pain that's going through your body. That's just some twisted God somewhere thinking all this kind of stuff. And you are nothing more but a thought. You're just like a little spirit something running around. Now, this is what the Gnostics were teaching. Now, the reason why that John had to deal with that is because that was coming into the church. And the problem with that coming into the church was is it removed, oh, I, I want, I want, mm, <laughs> it removed the flesh from the picture. That's how come John said, he that denieth that Jesus came in the flesh is of the spirit of the Antichrist. Because if you remove the flesh from the picture, then there is no excuse or there's no problem with sin. Because you are not accountable by what you do in the flesh. And so the atonement was not necessary. What you sin and what you do is not your problem. It's just some God thinking that you're doing all this stuff and it was coming into the church. And it's still floating around the church. just kind of comes in a different dress every once in a while. And this is how it sounds nowadays. doesn't matter about my temple or my outside. It's all in the heart. Well, that went over real well. Amen. The body and the flesh doesn't matter. It's all about my inner man. You ever heard anybody say that? God looks at the heart. That's actually a form of Gnosticism. You just don't know it. Amen. And so, boy, it's tied in here right now. And so John deals with that. He, he, he takes care of that. That's the reason why he said, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ that came. Because when he talks about water and blood, some people say that's the church. But it did not say this is she that came. Because the church is always in the feminine. It was not talking about the church that came by water and blood. John is using water and blood because it's the components of humanity to prove the humanity of Jesus Christ. Mm. Is this too far out there? Do I need to come back in? You better thank God he came in a human form. Because if he didn't come in a human form, there's no atonement. And if there's no atonement, there's no forgiveness of sins. And that means you're going to stand before a just God guilty of all sorts of stuff that you don't need to be guilty of. But thank God that God looked at humanity and said, I'm going to send a sacrifice He's going to the propitiation of all sins, and he's going to take care of this. Are you with me here tonight? Now, this is some of the stuff that John starts dealing with. But the real issue that John is going to deal with, that he spends most of his first epistle, and he spends several chapters in his gospel talking to us about. Oh, boy. Is this boring? Okay, good, because I don't want to be born. Now, when you read in the Gospels from John chapter 14 to John chapter 17, it's one long conversation. Actually, what is happening is, is Jesus is leaving the Last Supper, and he's on his way to Calvary. And this is a conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. It's just a private conversation that he's having with his disciples. And when he gets into this conversation, he's trying to prove something to them. He's talking about abiding. And he's talking about abode. And he's talking about being connected. And he's talking about I'm the vine and you're the branches. You ever read down through there, the 14th chapter, he starts talking about he's going away, coming back again, and the comfort is going to come. The actual translation says, I'm not leaving you like a bunch of orphans. I'm coming back again. We're going to connect. And then he gets into this vineyard deal, and the fact is, is when he starts teaching about I'm the vine and the branches, if you follow his footsteps, he is literally walking through a vineyard while he's teaching that to the disciples. So he's got this backdrop of a vineyard, and when he gets to the 15th chapter, he drops the hammer on them because he starts talking about I'm the vine and you're the branches. Folks, I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is going to talk to us tonight. I'm the vine and you're the branches. And as long as you stay connected to me, you're going to produce fruit. 
Now, I, I, I want to say this, and I want to say it very carefully because I'm not trying to argue with anybody, but I've heard people use this verse of Scripture, and they use it for the wrong reason because Jesus said if you're not producing fruit, you're, in other words, he said when you get disconnected, you're going to wither and die. You're not going to be producing fruit. Men are going to gather, gather you and cast you into, into the fire. And I've heard people say that if you're not producing fruit and you're not producing souls, that you, God's going to cast you into the eternal lake of fire. And they try to use that verse for that argument. Well, there's a few problems with that. Because number one, if you read down through there, the fruit that Jesus is talking about is not souls. The fruit is love. It's love. Now, all this is going to make sense here in just a second. It's love. It's love. And he's telling them the only way that my love can be in your life and you can produce this is you've got to stay connected to me. Because this is not your love that you're going to produce. This is the love of God that you're going to produce. This is the fruit of it. But if you get disconnected, you'll wither and die, and men will gather you and cast you into the fire. He didn't say the eternal lake of fire. He said the fire. And he said that men were going to cast you into the fire. I got some of you looking at me really funny right now. Men are going to cast you into the fire. I want you to tell me in the book of Revelation where it talks about being people being cast into the eternal lake of fire, show me one man casting another man into the eternal lake of fire. It's not men that cast into the eternal lake of fire. It's angels that cast into the eternal lake of fire. Now, if you study that verse of Scripture, what Jesus is actually saying is this. As long as we stay connected, my love is going to flow from the branch and the vine into the branch. <sighs> but if we get disconnected, you're going to wither and die, and that love's not going to be there. And I am going to allow people to put you into situations that's going to consume you. And I'll tell you how he does it. Are you all ready for this one? You ready for the bomb? It's called relationships. See, what we fail to realize, all the folks run around saying, I don't need anybody, I don't need any relationship, I don't need that stuff and all. You, you, you don't even know. Because God put us in this earth to connect with one another and to develop these relationships because this is the only place that this can really happen in. Oh, I'm having fun here tonight. Have you, have you ever been kind of out of sorts with God? I have. Don't sit there and act like a bunch of hypocrites. Come on, put your hand. You're honest. I have. I know some of you have been walking with Jesus. You've never been had a bad day. You've never went a while without really praying and talking to God like you should. I have. And let me tell you what starts happening. People start really irritating me. Yeah, they do. Things that normally wouldn't bother you, they start bothering you. And you get a little edge to you. Oh, you people in Australia act like, you no, know, you ain't doing that to me. You're, you're human just like, yeah, listen, the Gnostics are not in this building tonight. You are in flesh, and you're here, and you have to deal with the same nonsense we have to deal with. And when you start getting disconnected from your source, you start having trouble in your relationships with people. Oh, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Boy, it's... Here we are. Now, here's John. He said to the church at Ephesus on the Isle of Patmos, you've left your first love, right? So let's figure this out. Left your first love. So I was doing a study on this, literally in this subject that I'm talking to you about tonight. It has been an ongoing subject for several years because it's not just a subject to study. 
It's a life lesson. And I, the, the, the best translation of that verse in Revelation 2 is this. Ephesus, you're in trouble because you quit loving the brethren. No, 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 Brother Morgan. He said you left your first love. Okay, all right. All God needs to know about you and how you're connected to him is how you treat your brother. That's it. That's it. Now, we're going to have a little fun here tonight. See, John had some folks like I got here tonight. <laughs> now, I'm not calling you this, but John did. He said, you're lying. He said, let me tell you, because now, now you're into his epistles. And he deals several chapters about how we treat each other and how we love one another. Isn't it amazing that Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Watch him, not because you're casting out devils, not because you're healing the sick, not because you're raising the dead. That's the power of the kingdom. But what's the law of the kingdom? Well, James told you what the royal law of the kingdom was. James called it the royal law. Boy, I'm fixing to set the plow down, I'm afraid, right here. You know what the royal law is? It is the law that supersedes all laws in the kingdom, and the kingdom is governed mostly by this abiding law. It's called the royal law, and it's the royal law of the kingdom. And James said, love the brethren. He said, what's wrong with you people supposed to be spirit-filled? He said, you're going to battle. You're fighting each other. He said, from whence cometh wars and rumors of wars from among you? That stuff ought to be coming from God's people. That's just proving the fact that you are disconnected from your source because there's only a few things that the scripture says God is. God is truth. God is light. God is the spirit. You ready for the next one? God is love. And John said, if you can't love your brother whom you've He said, quit lying on the Holy Ghost. He said, oh boy. He said, here's how you tell if you're in life or death. If you love your brother. Boy, it's not going to be fun tonight, I'm afraid. Mmm. Mmm. I ain't talking about sensual love. Well, let's just dive a little further. He comes down through there and he says, now listen. He said, because God laid down his life for you, you all laid down your life for the brethren. Let me tell you why I never believe in the Trinity. Let me tell you why I could never believe in the Trinity. Because that one statement, God is love. And the love of God lays down itself. And if you got a trinity and you got a one God and three persons, three persons, co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent, and you got the Father who's supposed to have the love of God in him, and the love of God, the Father looks over at Junior and says, you go die for him. Now think about it. You go die for him. No, if it was really what it ought to be and the Trinity was actually true and God was in the Father, then the Father should have been the one. Oh, come on here. All you fathers here, if you're a real father, if somebody coming here with a gun going to shoot some folks, you would get between the bullet and your son. Yes, you would. What in the world's wrong with people when they get some twisted idea that God looks over Jehovah Jr. and says, you go die for him. I don't want to go die for him. You go die for him. 
Now, if I'd have been the son, I'd have said, hey, you're the father. You go die for him. And the Holy Ghost, we're trying to catch him because he's a floating dove. He, he's not even part of the equation. Do you think that Jesus got the short end of the straw and had to come? What kind of father's looking at his son getting his ever-loving brains beat in and doesn't do anything to stop it? Now, if we understand that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that just simply means that God put himself in a body and said, I'm fixing to pay the price to redeem you. I'm going to show you what the love of God really is. Now, 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 now. I got to hurry, I got to hurry. I got to hurry. Now listen, here's the deal. He comes on down through there. Oh, trust me, you're going to need to put your seatbelts on. We're going to hit some turbulence here in just a little bit. <laughs> some of you don't know what to think. I'm telling you, where did you find this preacher at? Let's ship him back. Now, he comes on down through there, and he starts making statements like this. He said, here's how we tell if you've passed from darkness and the light. Here's how we know if you're of the truth. You love the brethren. Now, John teaches us that there's only two commandments now. Two commandments. Does anybody know what those two commandments are? Believe on the name of his son, which if you understood what that means, is John is taking from the Old Testament the first commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. And he just shows you who that one God is when he told you to believe on the name of his son. He's pointing out that Jesus is that God of the Old Testament. Yes. And he says, love the brethren. Those are the only two commandments that John gives you, and those only two commandments. Is this too, is this too slow? Now, the reason why there's only two commandments like this is because if you got those down, you wouldn't need the other eight. Do you think you're going to steal from somebody if you love them? You think you're going to commit adultery with their wife or their husband if you really love them like you should? Do you think you're going to... No, 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 no. This is so simple. You get this love business right, everything else falls into place. If you don't get it right, now you got to have some other laws. Well, because you don't love God like you should, you don't love each other like you should, we got to give you some other laws. Please don't steal one from another. Please don't lie one on another. Now, just, just, just give me a moment here. Just give me. Now, when you, you, you come on down through there. Here's where it really starts getting interesting. Now, he starts making statements like this. And if you see your brother hath need and you shut up your bowels of compassion, how say ye the love of God abideth within you? For you're not to love in word only, but in deed or in action. Matter of fact, the word love in the Greek is agape. And it's a verb. If you understand how that works is you can't say it. You can only do it. Boys. Now, let's rock along here a little bit. Now, he gets into that, and then John decides to go all the way back. Here's where it gets really fun. He goes all the way back to Cain and Abel, and he says, now, I'm going to show you a little something, and I'm going to tie all this together. He says, now, the problem is, is he said, a lot of you are still like this because here's Cain and Abel, and they're offering a sacrifice, and Cain decides to slay his brother because God had respect for his brother's sacrifice and not his. And in his mind, if I put my brother out, I'm the only thing left God has to accept me. So I can murder my brother, which moves me into the position, I'm the only thing left God has to accept me. And after he slays his brother and God comes on the scene, he says, where's your brother? Now watch his statement. Does anybody know what his response is? Am I my brother's keeper? Oh. 
Now, why did John put all of that into his epistle? Because he's trying to show you, if you shut up your bowels of compassion and you don't help your brother, he said, you're saying the same thing that Cain said about Abel. Am I my brother's keeper? Huh? Am I my brother's keeper? Am I responsible for him? Am I responsible for him? My God, he lives in Fiji and I live in San Francisco. I'm not responsible for him. I know they got some needs and I know those people's got needs. But am I my brother's keeper? And besides that, if they perish, then, you know, the whole concept of humanity a lot of times is, is if you put their candle out, yours burns brighter. And this gets in the church. Listen, I've been at this long enough to know we're, we're, we're plowing pretty deep right now, but just hang on. Now he really comes down through here. And he starts talking about this commandment business, and he comes on down through there, and he says, and if thy heart condemn thee not, then is thou confidence toward God. If thy heart condemn thee not, then is thou confidence toward God, that whatsoever things we ask we receive of him, because we keep his commandment. But if thy heart condemn thee, he said, you have no confidence toward God. And you know who he's still talking about? He's still talking about Cain and Abel. And the fact that when Cain stood before God knowing he had just murdered his brother, he's standing now in condemnation and his heart is going to condemn him and it's going to judge him. And what John is trying to say is, is here's how you get your prayers answered and here's how you don't get your prayers answered. If you're trying to stand in the presence of God and have faith and you subconsciously know that you're not treating your brother right, he said it's a subconscious thing in you to condemn you. I'm going to tell you exactly why there's a lot of prayers not being answered in the church. Because we can't quit biting and devouring one another. And somebody does something you don't like, you already got your sword out. Oh, you wouldn't literally do it, but I'll tell you how you can do it. You got, yeah, you got McDonald's here. So after church, you know, you're all sitting at McDonald's. Now, you'd never take a gun and just walk up to her and blow her brains out, but I'll tell you what you will do. You'll be sitting at McDonald's and you'll start something like this. Now, I'm not gossiping. But I'm going to tell you something. And you'll take a knife out that's sharper than any knife you could have in your pocket. It's called your tongue. And you'll slander and you'll kill and you'll murder and you'll cripple and not think one thing about it. Because after all, am I my brother's keeper? Listen, folks, if you really want to have revival in Australia, I'm giving you the key to true apostolic revival. There is no other way around it. And you're deceiving yourself to think there is another way. I just, you know what, I, I, I'm 51. I've been preaching since I was 17. I've been at this a long time. And, and I heard Brother Stone King say something the other day. He said, I'm getting so old, I just don't care. You know, I'm, I said, you know, I'm not that old, but trust me, I'm not that old. <laughs> but I'm just kind of getting to the point where I'm just tired of playing games with Pentecostals. Come to church, you can't even talk to somebody across the aisle, and you think you're rapture ready. And then you wonder why your relationships get all messed up, and you wonder why you can't keep friends, and you wonder why you can't get along, and why jealousy rules and reigns. Oh, come on. That's crazy. Now, I'll tell you what you learn to do, though. Let me tell you what you learn to do. Boy, I feel a little preach coming on me. Let me tell you what you learn to do. You learn how to come to church and dance around a little bit and go looking for Jesus, and you talk in tongues, a little something you've learned, and then you walk out the same way you've always been, and you still got that big disconnect between you and the love of God, and everything in your life's all messed up. Can I just be honest with you? Your houses are filled with confusion. Your kids can't get along. There's nothing but turmoil. Where is the peace of God in all this stuff? I'm 
asking you, where is the peace of God in all this stuff? Peace is supposed to be like an umpire in your life. Well, I'll tell you where the peace of God. Let me tell you where it's at. Let me help you something. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Now, I started by telling you it's the royal law of the kingdom. So we're still talking about the kingdom. The royal law of the kingdom is love. Got that? And the prevailing spirit of the kingdom is peace. Because wherever God governs, there's peace. Now hang on. So look at your life and tell me the area in your life that there's no peace in. And I'll show you the area of your life that God does not govern. Is this too heavy, too much? Hang on, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. So here's the whole deal. We good? Yes. All right. So last night, no refunds. <laughs> now here, here's, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Paul even picked up on this some. He got into it with the Corinthian church over some of this stuff. Because, man, the Corinthians, they come together. They just come together. And you know what they do? They're just like, da 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 got the gifts of the spirit like a ball bat just beating a snot out of each other <laughs> have you ever been in a church service where somebody used tongues of interpretation to get a message to somebody else <laughs> thus saith the Lord you hypocrite <laughs> hey I've been there I've heard them <laughs> yeah you have too he used the gift of spirit. And I mean, Corinth is just all crazy, just all stuff and all. And so Paul has to come in there. He's teaching on the gifts of the spirit. And right in the middle of the gifts of the spirit, he says, oh, by the way, let me tell you about something that's very important. We call it the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. It's called the love chapter. Now, this one you're going to have to fix. Seriously. I think what Paul said, uh, when I was a child, I speak as a child, I understood as a child. But when I become a man, I put away childish things. Because when you really understand spiritual maturity, the highest dimension of spiritual maturity, according to Peter, add to your faith virtue and to virtue not. Am I born, y'all? Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, the knowledge temperance, the temperance patience, the patience brotherly kindness. And the seventh one is love. Now, what's the difference between brotherly kindness and love? So you think because you're nice to one another, it's love. I think that love has a lot to do with something called forgive. Not just being kind to them, but brother, when they are when they're really messing with you and you have the power to slay them, Cain, and you don't, and you forgive. Now think about the term forgive. That's already predetermined in your mind by the love of God. Doesn't matter what you do to me. I have already forgiven to you the mercy of God. Just stay, I, I, gotta, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta get out of this right here. Just, just you know, if G, Peter said, how many times we gotta forgive him? 70 times seven daily. Now that one day I said, how many times would that be? How many seconds would that mean I had to forgive somebody? And I figured that's either three seconds or every eight seconds I'd have to forgive. <laughs> you know what Jesus was actually saying? Every time it comes back into your mind, forgive them. Now, I don't care who told you, when you forgive them, you forget. Oh, baloney. That's it, humanly impossible. 
Just by the time you think you forgot, they walk in. They lied on you, they stole from you, they cheated, did all that stuff. And there they are, singing in the choir. Wearing new shoes and they still owe you money. I'm trying to make this as real as I can make it. And you're sitting there struggling. I know that's elementary, but you're sitting there struggling with it. And if you get disconnected, guess what? The love of God, that's the love of God. It's the, see, this is what we fail to realize. We think it's the love we produce. It is the love of God in us. And the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And as long as I stay connected to it, and I see them, you know what I do? I come back to Calvary. Okay, Jesus, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. I'm struggling with this right now. And he says, do good unto them that spitefully use you. Is this too, elders, is this too much? <laughs> Here's what tickles me. Everybody wants to be like Jesus. I just want to be like Jesus. Uh, uh. Yeah, sure you do. Let me tell you about Jesus. He calls Judas the devil, and he calls, <laughs> who's got betrayed him? He calls Peter the devil, and he calls Judas his friend. Now, Judas is pulling a sword, going to fight for him, and Judas is Peter, and Judas is selling him out. And then he's hanging on the cross, and he looks at the people that's crucifying him and he makes this statement father forgive them for they know not what they do i'm fixing to mess with some of you so bad right now you don't even see this one coming come here brother dathan you ready for this one and so god says so you want to be like me that means you got to get crucified come here. now crucify yourself here, put your hand up there on Calvary, on the cross. Take a, take a, you, can, I, you can actually hold a nail right through there. You got a hammer in that hand? Now nail that hand on there. Yeah, go ahead and nail it on there. Okay, you got your hand nailed to the cross? You got it good? Okay, now finish off the rest of the crucifix. You, you what? Can't do it. Oh, he can't do it. So you know what God needs in your life? They're called agents of crucifix. Why don't you listen to me? You don't even understand how God works. Now, he's going to send people into your life, their job. This, this sermon's not going over too well. No, no, no. Their job is to finish you off. Their job is to crucify you. Watch me to make sure you're dead. Because after all, to be like him, you've got to die out. That's what Calvary's all about. Dead, I'm dead, I'm dead, I die. Except the corn of grain fall into the ground and die. It abideth the long See, our problem is we don't want to die out. And so every time somebody comes with a nail and a hammer, bless God, you ain't touching me. You, I'll shoot you. I'm sorry, I'm from America. We, we shoot people. Break in my house. There you go. Call 911. We'll launch you and pray the prayer of faith. But you shouldn't have broken here. <laughs> now here's the deal. God's going to pick them out. They're going to come into your life. And they're going to say, do you really have my love in you? Can you pray the same thing? Boy, I'm going to tell you, I got them lined up about a mile long. And every time I see him coming, I'm like, oh. Is this too real or too honest for some of you here tonight? Some of you got me worried. This is life. And this is what's hindering us from having revival. Because none of us want to die out and let the love of God flow through us. 
And we want to keep living. We want our, our little deal to go through. Okay, now, you better go sit down because i got to wrap this sermon up. <laughs> so here's Paul. He gets in this whole 13th chapter. Now, personally, I believe when he starts talking about, I don't care if you understand all mysteries and you have all this knowledge and you got faith to move a mountain. Now, I want you to think about this. If we had a man like that in the apostolics, whoo, son, he'd be powerful. He'd be preaching everything there is to preach. He'd be gone. And Paul said, if you can move mountains by your faith and you understand all mysteries and all revelations been given to you, but you don't have love. He, listen, he said, it didn't profit you one thing. He said, I don't care if you give all your possessions and give your body to be burned at the stake. If you didn't have love, it didn't profit you one thing. Now, do me a favor when you get home tonight, instead of doing something you shouldn't do, Listen, go to the 13th chapter and read all the characteristics about love. Love's not puffed up. Love vaunteth not itself. Love is pure. Read all of that stuff about love. And what you're going to find out is you're not going to like the 13th chapter, 1 Corinthians, because it shows you where you ought to be, and then you see where you're at. And Paul had the same problem, and I'm convinced when he spoke about when I was a child, I spake as a child, what he's saying is, watch this, when I was operating in all that stuff, I really was in spiritual immaturity. But when I become a man, I put away childish things. Now listen to me. This is what the Holy Ghost is trying to get this end time church to. It's called spiritual Maturity, because if anybody ought to be getting it, it ought to be Holy Ghost filled Pentecostals. Are you listening to me? But you think your tongues gives you a right to devour. Now, I'm going to change it and close. Here's what I find ironic. You ready? Ephesus apparently didn't get it. Because a few years later, guess who tucked the city over? Anybody know? Somebody tell me. Anybody know? The Muslims. They took it over. The religion of fear. And here's Timothy struggling struggling because Paul writes to him and his first letter he writes to him he's trying to help him understand this is how you put the church in order when he writes his second letter to him it's very apparent that fear is beginning to cripple Timothy and Timothy's operating in fear because Paul has to remind him God did not give you that spirit of fear but of love power and a sound mind Oh, by the way, Timothy, why don't you stir up the gift that's in you? Now, you've got to understand, Timothy is at Ephesus. You've got the temple to the goddess Diana. Stay with me here. I'm about through. You've got the temple to the goddess Diana. You've got all this stuff going on. You've got spiritual opposition. Paul talked about it. He talked about wrestling with the beast of Ephesus. You talk about a hard place to pastor. Ephesus was tough. And it's very apparent that Timothy has been stricken by fear. And that's the reason why when you watch John's letter being wrote to him from the Isle of Patmos, God has to remind him, you better go back and take that church back from whence you've fallen. Because if you don't get a handle on this fear, and can I tell you what the opposite See, we all say, well, what's the opposite of love? Well, it's hate. No, it's not. The opposite of love is fear. Now, what you Pentecostals, listen to me. We are fastly approaching a day and an hour in the end time where the enemy is going to use everything he can against your mind, listen to me, to strike fear. 
I can prove to you from the book of Daniel where it talks about he will seek to wear out the saints of the Most High, that that's dealing with the mind. And your battle right now is in your mind. And in your mind is all the fear and the scenarios and the what ifs. Are you listening to me? The reason why some of you cannot walk in the power of the Holy Ghost is because the enemy holds you paralyzed by fear. You got that? Now I'm going to share something with you that I don't normally go into. I haven't for a long time. In 2000, we went to the Philippines. 2001, we did the Crusades. We come back in January of 2001, and in February the 19th of 2001, Mark Morgan fell off the end of the world into the deepest, darkest pit you can imagine. And for years, for years, I struggled with panic and fear. I have sat in my room for days, not even coming out with the mini blinds drawn and curled up in a fetal position because somebody would warn me prophetically, you're getting ready to go through something and there's darkness coming and you are going to literally meet Satan himself. You will know what it's like to be in a room with Satan himself. That's why some of you don't intimidate me. You got a little measure of fear working out of you that you try to intimidate people. But trust me, I met him. I can take you to the spot where he come in the room. And I'm going to tell you what the room feels like when you're in a room with Satan himself. Are you ready for it? It's called hopelessness. Not violence, not evil. It's hopelessness because he is chained in everlasting chains of hopelessness. He has no future. He has no hope. And so he wants to strike fear into your life and to paralyze you and to make you feel that you have absolutely no hope. It's not going to change. You're not going to be delivered. You're never going to come out of this. Are you listening to me right now in the Holy Ghost? When I start talking to you about the love of God and fear, it's not just a cute sermon to me. It is a revelation. Because years ago when God, when I told you all that I told you about this morning, about operating in the gifts, what I didn't tell you was is I figured it out real quick. Most of the people that I ever knew that operated in the gifts went crazy. They went off somewhere. Went nuts somewhere. And I kept thinking, what future is that? Who wants all of that? Are you listening to me? And I pushed away from it until an old prophetess by the name of Marilyn Chenault, she's almost 80 now, one of the most godly women you'll ever meet in your life, has spoken into my life so profound, I can't begin to tell you the time she's perfectly spoke to me and saved me. And I pushed away from the gifts and I pushed away from all the stuff I preached about today. And one morning she called and she said, have you not been praying? How can you operate the gifts of the Spirit and not be destroyed? It was about six something in the morning. I sat straight up in bed. I said, I, I have. She said, I'll tell you how it works. The gifts of the Spirit operate from, through, and by love. And the first time you start operating them out, the, out of the confines of the love of God, she said, you're on your way to destruction, son. Do you hear me? Because the gifts of the Spirit is not to make you look spiritual, and it's not to make you look powerful. Are you listening to me? And when Paul said, covet the best gifts, let me tell you what I think that means. When I look at you, sir, and I am moved by compassion for your situation and your need, and I realize that I have nothing within myself to help you with that problem, I covet that God would give me some kind of a gift because I will not say I am not my brother's keeper because I am your keeper. Are you listening? Will you let me finish the story real quick? I know I'm boring, some of you, and I'm sorry, but just listen. 
I sat there in that room that day. And I can't even begin to tell you the thoughts. I won't even take the time to tell you. And I'm sitting there asking God, you got to help me. Please listen to me because I'm trying to help somebody here right now. I said, God, please help me. I'm not asking you to take me out of this battle. I'll learn whatever it is I got to learn. But I'm asking you to give me some kind of a weapon or something that I can use. I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's a spirit of fear that's trying to cripple our world right now. You don't know what the future holds. The Middle East is heating back up. The world's economy is still teetering right now. Are you listening to me? All the stuff we don't understand. We don't know. We know We know what the end time the scripture says and all. We're facing all that. And you get all the stuff that starts going through your brain. And all, is this making sense? And then you got the spirit of the Antichrist that I'm going to wear you out. I'm going to keep attacking you with fear and blasphemy. And I'm going to question the word of God in your life. And I'm going to make you question whether or not you even think God loves you. That's what it exactly means. And so sit, if I go on too long. So sitting there that day, the Holy Ghost said, look at the story of Job. And I got mad. I said, oh, my God, you got to be kidding. I've heard that story so many times. I know it frontwards and backwards. Please tell me you're joking. That's exactly what I said. Please tell me you're joking. Look at it closer. Did not Satan have to have permission to get to him? And that even made me even more mad. I know that. God, I've heard that all my life. He said, then you're missing it. I said, what am I missing? Show me where he ever warned Job what he was going to do. I said, what? Show me where he ever went to Job and said, I'm fixed to kill your kids. I'm fixed to take your money. I'm fixed to mess with your health. I said, he didn't. He said, that's exactly right. Because when I give him permission to come into your life, I don't give him permission to warn you, and I don't give him permission to brag. I only give him permission to do it. So whatever it is he's telling you this day that he's going to do means he doesn't have permission to do it. Because if he had permission to do it, he wouldn't be telling you about it. He'd be doing it. So I'm trying to tell somebody here in that little spirit of fear that's crippling you right now about the future and how what's going to happen. Whatever it is the enemy is telling you he's going to do to you means that he can't. If he could, he already would have. Now hang on, we're fixing close. He already would have. If he could kill you, we'd be singing at your funeral right now. And so I started kind of getting a little handle. Now I'm closing. And so here's the deal. I started looking at all this, and I said, okay. And I was very privileged to have some people come into my life that were people that epitomized the love of God. One of them was my old bishop called Merle Ewing. I've seen people spit on him, lie about him, tell stories that weren't true, and watch him go fall on them and pray for them and help them and help them out financially and help them with their kids when the whole time these people were destroying him and his family. I asked Sister Ewing one time about the song they wrote when I've sat at supper time with an old friend of mine and in return my love is betrayed. But if to the bitter end I can still call him my friend, then I can say I've loved. On a morning hot and still, if I could but climb that hill with a cross that's too heavy to bear, if I could learn to pray, Father, forgive that others might live, then I can say I've loved. I said, Brother Ewing, where did she get the words to it? He said, was in one of our deepest trials and a person that we loved dearly that was a comrade in arms hurt us so deeply. He said, it was almost unbearable. And said, we were up early one morning praying and Joan sat down and penned the words of that song. Then I can say I've loved. See, your true spiritual maturity is not denoted by how many miracles you can do. It's how much love you can give. (laughs) 
I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up. I really am. And so I kept looking at it. I, I'm sorry I've taken way too long tonight. But let me just finish right here. Where are the miracles, God? Why are we not seeing more miracles? I'm asking us, where are the miracles here tonight? And you know what we're all going to say? Well, if we had a little more faith. No. 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 Let me tell you where the miracles are going to come from. When you look around at each other and you move with compassion. Now, listen. Listen. <clears throat> This is not pat me on the back. Where's the lady at that brought the people from the home today? Right there. So you brought those people from the home and you had me pray for their minds. You, aren't you, aren't you manager of the home and you bring? Can I pick on you a second? So you guys kept bringing people up here and a lot of people said, why are you praying for those people? I'm going to tell you why I'm praying for them. Let me tell you why I'm praying for them. Because experience teaches you compassion. And the first one you brought to me, I had a little flashback. That could be me right there. Because I know what it's like to stand on the brink of nervous breakdowns and a total mental collapse. And the doctor's telling everybody he'll never survive, he'll never make it. And I'm watching all these people, and it wasn't faith that I was asking for this morning. I was wanting God to move me with compassion that I would remember when God healed me. And let me tell you how God healed me from all of that. He healed me through his word. I would get up every morning, and I'd read the word of God for two or three hours at a time. And that's why I told you, first thing in the morning, you get those people down and read to them the word of God. Because the word of God will heal them. Look through. The end time revival is going to come through love. When you look at the world and you love it like Jesus does, and you look at each other and you love each other like Jesus does. So I can't think of a better way to end Turning Point 2013 than this. The miracles that you're after, the revival you're after, it's going to come through a fast, fresh baptism of the love of God. Because you are my brother. You are my brother. If there's any way that I can help you. You know, we wouldn't have to beg for offerings if people just learned this. I know you're tired and I've preached way too long. We wouldn't have to beg for money. We wouldn't have to beg for help. People just respond out of the love of God. That's what moved Jerusalem. It's when they seen them giving and helping one another. They had all things in common. That's when great miracles, signs, and wonders happened among them. And the whole city was moved. And 5,000 people received the Holy Ghost. Not because some great super apostle, but because they seen them have all things in common. And when Australia and Sydney and Fiji and all this region start seeing the apostolics and the spirit-filled people loving one another like they should and having all things in common, trust me, something will happen in that dimension that your tongue talking cannot do and your prophesying cannot accomplish. Is this too far and too deep? There's miracles in this building tonight and they're not coming by faith. They're going to come when you look at that person next to you and you say, I am my brother's keeper and it's my responsibility to pray for them tonight and to believe God for something to happen. And I'm asking the Holy Ghost to use me right now and impart to me whatever gift that is needed for them to get their need met right now. So we're not off the hook tonight. We're fixing to pray for each other. And when we start praying for each other, I'm not going to ask you to pray with great faith and boldness. What I'm going to ask you to pray is I'm going to ask you to pray, first of all, let the love of God flow through me right now. Let the love of God flow through me right now. Let me pray for that person with deep compassion and with deep feeling and with deep conviction. 
I ask that the love of God flow through. I ask that miracles would happen. I ask that the touch of God would come right now. I ask for it in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I know some of you, you aren't too attached and you're ready to go. But I'm asking you right now to open your mouth and your heart and ask God, let the love of God flow through me right now. Come on, let the love of God flow through me right now. Let there be a baptism of the love of God coming in the service right now. You are my brother. You are my sister. Your needs are very important to me. I cannot turn my head. I cannot say, am I my brother's keeper? I cannot do that. I cannot do that. I will not do that tonight. I will not be selfish. I will not be self-centered. I will not do that. I will be concerned about your need, and I will be concerned about the miracle that you have to have right now. And I'm going to help you get that miracle tonight because I love you. So you thought we was going to end on this big high, and it'll come in here in just a minute. But right now, it's a fresh back. Come on, some of you need to repent right now. God, forgive me for being so self-centered. Forgive me for it all becoming about me. Forgive me, Lord, for it becoming about the flesh and my desires and what I want. Forgive me, oh God, that I refuse to look at the needs of others. Forgive me, Lord. Help me not to get disconnected. Help me not to get disconnected right now, God. Help me to be connected to my source. I'm telling you, miracles are fixing to flow through this building right now. Whoo! Now reach over and connect with somebody right now. Hand on their shoulder, take them by the hand, whatever is appropriate. I want you to connect to them. Because that person has a need. Well, it's not my concern, I don't care. All that's telling off on you is that you're not connected. Now I want you to just start praying for that person right now like you would want them to pray for you. Would you do that right now? Would you pray for that person that you're holding their hand or you're connected to right now? Come on, all across this building, I'm going to ask you to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Come on, the Holy Ghost is shed abroad in the heart, the love of God by the Holy Ghost. I'm going to ask you to let the Holy Ghost work and flow through me right now while I pray for this. Come on. Paul told you that love would never fail. That love would never fail. There's a revival coming to Sydney. There's a revival coming to Australia. There's a revival. There's a visitation. And we're preparing for that visitation. Come on, that's it. Pray in the Holy Ghost. There's miracles going to flow through here right now. Woo. Come on, there's a river starting to flow in this place right now. There you go. There you go. There you go. Woo. Such as I have, give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, something's trying to break here right now. There's some of you, you need to, you, you need to fix something in the Holy Ghost right now. Come on, that's it. In the Holy Ghost, you need to fix it. The enemy's done everything he can to put a rift between you and them. And you need to fix it right now and the Holy Ghost. The enemy's done everything he can to cause division between you and them. But tonight, you need to choose, I forgive and I release it and I'm going on. I forgive right now. I forgive right now. I forgive right now. I give mercy. I give forgiveness. I give it right now. I give it by the love of God. I give it to you. In the name of Jesus, I pray that the blood of Jesus Jesus would cleanse you from all sin. 
Father, don't lay it to their transgression. Don't lay it to their charge. I pray for you right now. That, come on, the Holy Ghost is moving right now. I pray for you in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for you. I pray for you. I will not be Cain. I will not rise up and slay you. I will look at you as my brother and know that I am my brother's keeper. And I've come tonight to help you. I've come tonight to help you. Come on, pray for them in the Holy Ghost. There's some things beginning to crumble here in some of your hearts right now. Come on, I feel the peace of God in this place right now. Let God govern this service right now. Come on, I beg some of you to open your heart to the love of God. Let the love of God cause the hardness and the experiences of life to melt away. Let the love of God cause you to be able to forgive the abuse and to forgive the hand that caused it and to go on now free. Go on, sir. Go on. That's it. Go on. That's it. Go on. Somebody's about to go free right now. I'm telling you, somebody's about to go free right now. Some of you, for the first time in your life, the love of God's really starting to penetrate into your heart right now. And you feel the mercy and you feel the forgiveness and you feel that love like a hot something coming into your life right now. Woo! I'm telling you, God's doing miracles right now. Come on, pray one for another now. Pray one for another. Start praying, okay, Lord, whatever the need is, whatever the miracle is. Come on, from the front to the back, there ought not be a gap in this building where the love of God's not flowing through the pews right now. In the name of Jesus.